this is just some information about the actual presentation and some of this information will be made available uh, at the links you see at the bottom. So I'm going to give an introduction to the Pathogen Detection Isolates Browser. Some of you may not be familiar with this. This project, and I'll give you some background on this project, uh, really started uh, five or six years ago. It came about because the food safety agencies in the US, FDA and CDC, were considering switching from pulse field gel electrophoresis to whole genome sequencing. And uh, FDA started that by forming this, what they call the Genome Tracker Network. Um, and you can see on the left-hand side, the number of labs that have uh, are parts of that Genome Tracker Network. And they wanted to focus on Salmonella, but CDC uh, in the summer of 2013 said that we should focus on Listeria as a pilot project, wherein all Listeria collected in the US from both clinical food and environmental samples will be sequenced and submitted in real time. And we had a meeting where we agreed to uh, contribute to that project. And the reason to focus on Listeria is, of course, it is it has a very low incidence in the population. So it's a tractable problem. So all the isolates could be sequenced uh, in real time, but it has a high morbidity and mortality rate. And so sequencing these would have a, a major benefit to the health of uh, Americans. So this is a slide from one of our collaborators at FDA showing how the network functions right now. Samples from clinical, human, food, animal, environmental are taken by the various agencies as part of these networks. That includes FDA's genome tracker network, CDC's PulseNet network, state uh, clinical health labs, and the USDA uh, Food Safety Inspection Service also takes samples as well. They submit the raw genomic sequence data to NCBI. Typically, these, these are from Illumina instruments, uh, either 2x250 or 2x150, and they supply minimal metadata. And all this data is publicly available. Of course, they have uh, highly protected metadata that they store locally that we do not see. So what facility this isolate was taken from or information about the patient. So we built an analysis pipeline that really wants to answer uh, two things at this point in time. Are these isolates clonally related? Is there a point source for a food outbreak, for example? And then the second thing is uh, I'll touch briefly on is what is the set of genes that encode antimicrobial resistance in these isolates. So I'm not going to go into a lot of details of the analysis pipeline. We are making changes to it, and so there will be publications coming out at some point describing this in detail. But the basic idea is the data coming from the surveillance network goes into SRA, and we assemble it and do some quality filtering on that. And we also pull in assemblies from GenBank for the same organism, so let's say Salmonella. And we cluster those together using single linkage clustering. Uh, right now we use a 50 SNP max breakpoint. Uh, we will be switching to whole genome multi locus sequence typing uh, probably in April. And the idea is that we want to basically form clonal clusters of highly, of you know, closely related isolates. We are not intending to do the full phylogenetic tree of all Salmonella this way. So for Salmonella, we have several thousand clusters of size two to size several thousand. Within each cluster, we do a phylogenetic reconstruction and make that data available. And I'll show you some examples uh, in just a few minutes. For the antimicrobial resistance, we first put together a reference database of acquired antimicrobial resistance genes. We've created software to identify those genes, and we're working on a manuscript describing that software. It's called AMR Finder. And we've also created, uh, well, we didn't create a database. We basically attached antibiograms to biosample submissions. So antibiograms are tabular formats of these antibiotic susceptibility tests, either MICs or disdiffusion. And we attach those to the biosample database if the submitter is willing to supply that data. We integrate that all into the isolates browser. So the pathogen detection isolates browser is utilizing new technologies at NCBI, including things like solar. Uh, but what that means is because we are trying to develop this very quickly and get it out to our collaborators as soon as possible, it means it's not fully integrated into other resources. So some of you will be familiar with the, the drop-down database menu option on the left and you won't see pathogen there and you won't see it in the global database list it's actually kind of hidden 
under health, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. So this is a screenshot, and then right after this, I'll give you a demo. Uh, this is the Pathogen Detection Isolates Browser. It's in beta, which means it's a work in progress. We are continually evolving its capabilities, and it's not a, something like we would have done in the past where we would have spent two years building something and then released it. We basically released it back in 2016 and have been continually uh, adding features to it. So what that means is there's no help documentation yet, but there is a fact sheet. Oh, you'll see it on the uh, upper right menu under learn more there's a fact sheet it's a pdf that gives you some of the basics of how to use our resources it'll be similar to what i cover in this uh, webinar we will work on help documentation in the future uh, and part of the reason for that is the search capabilities are still things that we're playing with and so we want to make sure that the search is as streamlined and as smooth as possible for people to use and not document it in its incomplete form at this point in time what that does mean is that the search syntax is not the same as what you would typically see in entry databases like nucleotide or genome. So at this point, I'm just going to give you a demo. So it's available at the base URL slash pathogens. So basically, this is the webinar that we're giving right now. It gives you a brief description of what's going on, it has a couple of example searches, and then I'll cover this in just a minute. Then you have some basic information, including that fact sheet I told you about, and I'll just open this for a second. You'll see it covers sort of a couple of basic examples of how to do the searches. Um, information on antimicrobial resistance, some of the reference databases we put together, and how to submit data. So if any of you are interested in submitting data to us, uh, you can contact us and uh, follow these links. For exploration of the data, you have a couple of options. You have, we put all the data available on FTP. So if you want to actually do batch downloads, I would suggest you go there. I won't be covering FTP today. And we have find isolates now. It will take you directly to the browser. And then we also break it down by organism. So here we have the top four foodborne pathogens in the U.S. We have Salmonella, E. coli, and Shigella, Listeria, and Campylobacter. And we see the total number of isolates. So we already have over 100,000 Salmonella in this system. And then the number of new isolates. So if you recall, I said we make single linkage clusters by 50 SNPs. We attempt to do that within every 24 hours. Uh, sometimes it doesn't work. You'll see that more fully here on the full list. These are all the organisms that we're currently clustering. Uh, many of them are not foodborne pathogens, so I won't cover those in much detail. Some big examples that you won't find here right now are Staphylococcus aureus. We plan to add those uh, later on this year when we make the switch to whole genome MLST clustering. Let's look at the top row, Salmonella. Uh, this is the version that was released on March 16th, and the latest isolate that was added that was included in this release was from March 14th. So we have a bit of almost two-day delay, and we're trying to get that down. Basically, it means from the previous release, which would be version 1147, we had 78 new isolates added to the system. And the breakdown of that is 51 clinical isolates and 27 environmental isolates. All these links uh, go into the pathogen browser and as well as this link right here. So the browser is basically, unlike most of the other databases at NCBI, it presents you the information without even having to do a search. It's in a tabular format, which is also different. For the ISA browser, every row in this table is an assembled genome, either assembled through our system of assembly and annotation or uh, one we collected from GenBank. You have, some, you have a search box up here, which I'll go into a little bit of detail. We have some default organism groups. Those match the ones from the table I just showed you. And then we have some columns here that includes the metadata supplied by the submitter. So this particular isolate was collected in New York. Uh, some things that we calculate, and I'll cover a couple of those, but there's also additional columns here. And you can choose which columns you want to show with this uh, tool right here. All right, there's a, there's a couple of critical columns that I want to cover in a little more detail, and that's the, the min def. So this is the, as I said, we make clusters of 50 SNPs. And so we also categorize isolates by two types, environmental or clinical. So this column here is the minimum SNP distance from this isolate to one of the opposite type. So this first row is not in a SNP cluster, so it's not actually related in our system to anything else. So that means it could be 51 SNPs away from something else or 500. We don't know at this point in time. 
because as I said, we're trying to identify clonal isolates that may be the point source of a foodborne outbreak. The second row is an isolate also from New York. Um, it is 12 steps away from something of the opposite type. It's an environmental, food or environmental type. So it is 12 steps away from a clinical type. If we scroll down here, for example, on row 16, we see another isolate, another listeria. It's 33 simps away from something of the opposite type. It's clinical, so that means it's 33 simps away from something that's a food or environmental source. And so if you sort in this column, you can actually identify things that are basically clonally related. So I'll give you an example. I'll do a search for the new isolates. And if I sort that and focus on, let's say, Listeria, there's 22 new isolates for Listeria. And here's an isolate that's, again, this 12 snips away, and then that grows. So these SNP distances might be sufficient for someone in our public health labs to look at this and determine that they do not need to do any further investigation. If I switch to something like Salmonella, now we're getting down to like two SNPs. So this is a sediment isolate from Virginia. It's two SNPs away from another clinical isolate. So not only do we do these SNP distances, we actually provide this in a phylogenetic tree, like I said. So I'm going to open that up. And this is what we call the isolate tree viewer, the, the, the SNP tree viewer. So we have three panels in this view. We have a navigation panel, and I'll show you how that works in a few minutes. We have a table with all the metadata that's similar to the table on the front page. And then we have the phylogenetic tree down here. And this is like Google Maps. You can just pick it up and drag it, and you can zoom in, and you can zoom out. Um, and you can see this is this isolate is in a SNP tree of 978 salmonella isolates. This is the cluster accession for that. And so this obviously is a, is a pretty large uh, SNP cluster. You can see parts of the tree that are very closely related and other parts that are more distant. Uh, the interesting thing is you can make selections both on the table and on the tree. So I can actually, from the search, I had identified this isolate as a new isolate. So it came in on the 14th. But I can actually highlight another isolate. And now what happens when I have more than one isolate selected is I get this sort of SNP distance measurement uh, up here on the navigation panel. So you can see there's only two isolates, so basically the minimum, maximum, average are all the same. Two, four SNPs separate these two isolates from each other, uh, separated uh, from August last year to March this year. The other interesting thing is, I'm going to go back to this search view, is we intersect the searches with the number of isolates. So here we see when I search for the new isolates, five isolates are in that tree that I was actually just looking at. So now this navigation panel becomes useful because not only does it tell you the SNP distances and the breakdown, you can see these are environmental isolates from Maryland and Virginia and New York and a clinical isolate. When you click on this, it actually just jumps immediately to where that isolate is in the tree. And we built this part because these large trees were increasingly much more difficult to just drag around like a Google Maps. You can see how long this takes to get to the next isolate, whereas this, you just zoom around like landmarks in a map. We also have a, a filter. This is um, only filtering the metadata that's here. So I could say only want the isolates from Maryland. And now those just come to the top and you can clear that filter. But we also have a search box. So I can do a search for chicken. Now it's going to highlight everything in the tree that is from chicken. And I can add that to the selection set. So now you can see almost everything in this tree comes from chicken. So that's a reminder to properly cook the chicken that you're eating, please. We also get this breakdown by year. And this, this navigation panel is something we're actually evolving right now. And so it'll probably change in just a few months, sometime in the summer. So this search box allows you to both highlight items in the tree, but also to add to the selection set on the left-hand panel. You can also do subtractions. So I see things that are from Maryland. I think this will work. I'll do a subtraction. 
and then the Maryland isolates disappear. I think there was only one, so it dropped from 539 to 538. You can also clear this, and you can actually make a selection directly on the tree itself for multiple isolates. You can do that by selecting all leaves. So here I have just highlighted a small set of clinical isolates. Looks like they're all from Boston or the US from two different years. And I can also just make a subtree. So if I click on this button, now I just have the isolates that I had selected uh, by this action node. You can collapse it as well and then expand it if you want. But this allows you to do an export. So we have a a little warning if you were trying to export large trees, but exporting small trees like this is very easy and you can dump it as a PNG file. That way, that's not a very good viewer, but you get the idea. You can export it as PDF and also as a Nuic tree if you want to load it into your own phylogenetic tree viewing software and do additional work with it. You can also share this view. So if you hit this button, you now have a, a little box that you just clip on and you can copy paste that into another viewer. You can send it by email. If you find something interesting, you want to send it to your colleagues, you can just do use the share button. When you're in the subtree view, uh, it tells you that you're in the subtree view up here and then you can actually go back to the full tree here. I should know what that does that it causes a collapsing view. Um, this is a feature that we were testing, and so what it does is it collapses nodes that are not selected, and then when you highlight those nodes, you can actually see sort of the breakdown. So we see here there's 224 isolates in this subtree, a uh, mix of, of various sorts of um, clinical and environmental. Uh, this is something that is uh, still being worked on, so it's not fully uh, worked out yet. If you want to go back to the full tree view and then just hit the full, the whole tree view, and now you get back to the original view that we came in on. Uh, you can see this isolate here. You can actually hit the information button, and you'll get additional information on the metadata, but that's very similar to what you see when you hover over the tree. Some people might find that it's annoying, so you can actually turn it off, and then that doesn't happen. You can do things like control the spacing of the tree, so you can separate it for better visibility. You can collapse that if you want. There's a few other options here. You can you know, expand and contract the tree branches. This is the snip distances. Make it more spread out if you want. I should also point out that the, the selections allow you to control what's selected in the table view. So you can see here we selected seven isolates out of the many that we have. And you can download this button. Uh, I have the, unfortunately, there's control panels over here. There's a download button here that dumps a TSV file that is just the rows and isolates selected. And so you can choose which columns go into that table here, similar to the, the one on the main page. And the selection controls which isolates are selected for that tabular download. So you can make selections on the tree in the table to control the download for uh, whatever selection of isolates you're interested in. Okay, the only other thing I want to touch on is the antimicrobial resistance. So let's look at something that's obviously highly antibiotic resistant, Klebsiella. And we make these two columns available. One is the resistance phenotypes as supplied by the submitter and by the genotypes. And you could highlight that in the, the filter tab here. So it has a number of filters, and, and two of them are the uh, phenotypes and genotypes. So I'm going to select the phenotypes, and there's 516 of the total club Ciela that have supplier-submitted phenotypic data. So now you see that this column uh, actually has information, and you can expand that. You can see the breakdown. Basically, in this panel, we put the resistance calls, the SIR calls from whatever uh, interpretation criteria were used. So you can see calls in doesn't have interpretation criteria. So it's in the category of other. We also put the genotype information. So first I wanna, I wanna just cover the AST briefly. This is actually what's stored in the sample database. So now you have this tabular format. So it actually gives you the actual MICs, the interpretation. You can see that there's many of these are done by the CLSI standards, the actual measurements, uh, some information's optional, so it's not supplied. And you can see things like uh, Colliston is not 
defined because it's missing because there is no CLSI standard at this point in time. By adding it to this, you can actually do some interesting searches. I won't cover those in a lot of detail. I'll go back to the main page and see, for example, we have a search for isolates encoding a mobile call system resistance gene and a KBC beta lactamase. So if I click on this, I actually get six isolates that have both MCR and a block KPC allele. They have assembly links, so these have all been submitted to GenBank, so they, they were not assembled by our pipeline. You can see they're from Brazil, Portugal, Italy, and you can see the list of genes here. You have uh, KBC3 and MCR1.1, KBC2 and MCR1, etc. And so you can do searches. There are some examples in that fact sheet I pointed out to you. Um, we're working on the, as you can see, those of you who know things about aminoglycoside modifying enzymes, you can see that the uh, encoding of that genetic information is um, troublesome to many computer search programs. And so we're working on making these searches for things like APH3 prime, prime 1B easier. So you could just plunk it into the search box and do that search. Uh, that doesn't happen right now. So that's a new feature that we will add into the summer. So you may ask, uh, well, I'm not a public health lab. Uh, why is this useful to me? So not only could you get antibiotic resistance or sets of isolates with that antibiotic resistance, but we're planning to expand the sort of genes that we'll be making available in this system. So that includes virulence genes, metal resistance, biocide resistance. And so we'll be expanding this tool to incorporate those other uh, genes of interest to allow you to subset and select the full data set. So right now we have over 107,000 salmonella. We hope that this sort of interface will allow you to more effectively subset that data rather than doing, let's say, a blast search with a gene of interest. Because you can imagine searching across all 100,000 salmonella is just going to be time consuming. And so we hope to make these types of interfaces for large scale data uh, more effective across NCBI in general. So I think I'll stop there. I will just. Uh, Mentioned these are all the people that have worked on the project. If you uh, you see this email address highlighted in yellow, if you have any questions after the seminar, and this email address is linked on our Pathogen page, just please send us an email, and we'll be happy to answer them. And I think at this point in time, I'll take any questions, Peter. Uh, I, I'm afraid I lost power at the beginning of the webinar, so I can't participate in the questions pod. I'm on the phone. Yeah, sure. For those of you who are uh, connecting remotely, Washington, D.C. is undergoing a massive snowstorm, and so it's likely that many people are losing power. So, uh, Okay, so I'm going to go through a couple of questions. What WGMST scheme will be used? This is one that was actually developed in-house at NCBI. We will be making those available at some point. Basically, we've developed them for the four foodborne pathogens from TB and for, I think, close C. diff. And we've been trying to coordinate with CDC on some of their schemes, and I, we have an upcoming meeting after the ASM general meeting in Atlanta in June that we're supposed to be talking about that as well. Uh, another question, is urinary tract infection a foodborne disease? Uh, the organism that causes UTIs, for example, E. coli, uh, often is also found, uh, Aztecs are often found as foodborne disease. So we do see a mix of both of those in our system. So it's not strictly related to just foodborne, you know, S. typhi is an uh, obligate human pathogen, not typically associated with food, but we'll also see those. So we basically pull in all of the isolates under a particular species from our surveillance network plus in GenBank. Uh, is there any correlation between SNP cluster and classic STCC? I think the answer is that they will highly correlate. So the question is, are there a correlations between SNP clusters and classic sequence types and clonal complexes? And so simply based on the seven or whatever gene sequence types that were classically defined before, you would see a high correlation, but you cannot guarantee that correlation because, of course, uh, a small change in an allele will give you a different uh, allele, possibly sequence type, and different clonal complex, even though it might be part of the same SNP cluster. So it's not guaranteed, and it's something we have thought about adding as one of the, the features is just doing the classical sequence typing and just adding that as information so you could see SD258 isolates, for example. Okay, another question. The number of SNP differences between two isolates is the absolute number without filtering. SNPs to pass some filtering or the number of compatible SNPs from the COMPAT program. The SNP distances right now is from the COMPAT program. So this, I didn't go into details on this, but... Uh, one of our colleagues here at NCBI developed uh, or improved a method that's actually 30 or 40 years old. 
called maximum compatibility for the SNP or for the, for the phylogenetic reconstruction. It's now published and that software is available. Uh, it is very useful for highly clonal isolates, which is what our system was developed for. It's not very useful for highly diversion isolates. And so that system, the maximum compatibility system, basically looks for columns in the SNP matrix that are compatible with the phylogenetic reconstruction, which means that sometimes it throws away some of the columns. Why would you want to do that? Well, we found uh, sometimes when we looked at GenBank genomes, they have uh, incorrect SNPs with respect to the phylogenetic tree, and we suspect many times that's due to assembly problems. And so the system helps filter out some of the bad data. All right, next question, how to decide if it is a new ISA? Basically, as I said, we do the SNP clustering every 24 hours if new data has been submitted. So that new is basically a, a recency check on whether something's been submitted since the last time we did the calculation, that's all. Can we use this pipeline to analyze our own gene set? So I didn't touch on this, but uh, we built the system for public health with the idea from our colleagues that they would submit the data to us and make it publicly available. And so that's something that we're pushing that people who want to integrate their, their isolates into the system are either publishing them as part of papers, as part of their research, or part of surveillance networks and making the data publicly available. Uh, so right now the pipeline is not available for download. We will make certain parts of the pipeline available. So we, I didn't even touch on this. We are making a, a new assembler available. I think the paper for that is going to be submitted by the end of the month. And so we'll probably put links on the main page at some point uh, showcasing some of those features that will be made available. All right, is there a publication related to this application? Uh, as I said, we will uh, describe that at some point in the future. How can I add this as a project to my undergraduate students? I'm not sure if you are saying how you can get your undergraduate students to use this project. I'd be happy to touch base with you after this. Is this connected to Patrick? So Patrick is a NIAID funded system as part of the Bioinformatics Resource Centers. Um, uh, it is not directly connected to Patrick, but we've certainly coordinated with them on things like antibiotic resistance. Would it be possible to add a data column with classic MLST sequence type? Yes, that's something we're, we're thinking of uh, doing in the future. What are the future plans of NCBI for GenBank of such disease-causing pathogens? Well, besides making a system like this that allows you to more easily interrogate for interesting features, uh, it's something we actually need to talk about because we have 100,000 plus salmonella. That's quickly going to be a million salmonella in a few short years, and so we need to think about how to deliver uh, effectively to researchers when we have such large volumes of data that no, we could not expect somebody to download and do this analysis themselves. And so we're, we're interested in hearing from people on use cases for what they would use this data for or things that their research is interested in investigating across such large volumes. Are there better ways of submitting data on a weekly basis other than SRA Wizard? Well, SRA has multiple ways to submit. We have the uh, web-based wizard uh, for the submission portal, but the uh, the stuff that's coming into our network, there's a completely automated XML-based submission format that they developed, and so these are all completely automated systems. So I, I would urge you to contact SRA about those information. I'm not an expert on those. If you're interested in submitting data to us, uh, please contact them first. How can I see seminal serotype on the tree view? So right now we make the serotype, serovar available as a field, but that's based on what the submitter sent to us. And as you can imagine, in fact, I'll actually, I'll give you an example. So let's get rid of this search and we'll switch to Salmonella. Here's the serovar here. You can see it's St. Paul, Borelli, etc. If you're talking about adding the label of serovar onto the tree, that's something that's not yet built into the system. But I want to point out that we find very often that this zero of our zero type call is incorrectly made, and so we're thinking of adding an additional uh, in silico calculation of the zero type based on some various tools available. That will be some point later on this year. Okay, so that's a follow up on the SRA. So I would, if you're having problems with SRA submissions, I would, Peter, I think they could probably contact Help Desk, and you guys could help guide them through some of the SRA submission stuff. I don't work for SRA. Yeah, I'm here. So, yeah, if you're having trouble with submissions, just write to the info address, which is info at ncbi.nlm.nih.gov, 
and we'll we'll get that to somebody who can help you. And Bill, we're kind of out of time, so we probably need to wrap this up. If there's any remaining questions, we'll try to we'll endeavor to answer those in writing, and I will send that to everybody once this uh, recording is available on YouTube and that kind of thing is written up. I think there's just one more question. What is the difference between the relationship among the following resources? The National Database of Antibiotic Resistant Organisms, uh, the National Sequence Database of Resistant Pathogens. Basically, they're all the so the first two are all integrated into this system, and so saying that there's just a national database of antibiotic resistance pathogens, we say that we're making a database of pathogens and reporting on the antibiotic resistance genotypes encoded within those pathogens. The third one is the resistance gene database. Those are the genes that are the reference set of genes and alleles that we use to make the calls of the genotypes. I didn't have a lot of time to go into details. I think we can actually have a separate webinar on uh, antibiotic resistance. I would suggest anyone who has any other questions to send us uh, an email. And the last question on submission, again, you can always write to the, the submit-help or info for information on submissions. So I'd like to thank everyone for their time. Uh, I'll stop the recording now. And as I said, you can always send us emails and we'll follow up with you individually.